presents Hollywood. <laughs> Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, brings you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Janet Lee, George Murphy, and Donna Corcoran in Angels in the Outfield. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tomorrow night, our own Hollywood stars open their base- baseball season at home. And next week, the first baseball will be pitched in the Eastern League. It will be a while before we know which teams will end first and which last. But in tonight's play, Angels in the Outfield, we will tell you about a team which started seven and steadily got worse until they received some unusual heavenly help. And as our stars of this whimsical comedy for Metro Goldwyn Mayer, we have George Murphy. And in their original roles, Janet Lee and Donna Cocker. Well, I've never seen an angel, but I've seen some angelic complexion. I guess you'd call them angelic, those smooth, fresh, luxe, lovely complexions that our Hollywood actresses are so proud of. They love that fresh, radiant appeal that they can be sure of with Lux Toilet Soap Regular. Those Lux facials are so wonderfully easy, and yet... So effective. Now, Angels in the Outfield, starring Janet Lee as Jennifer Page, George Murphy as Guffy McGovern, and Donna Cochran as Bridget. I didn't know very much about baseball. My job was writing the household hints column on the ladies' page. But the paper was running a series of articles, What's Wrong with the Pirates? The sports editor wanted the woman's angle. Hey, Jennifer, sports is yelling for that story on today's game. So where is it? Oh, I haven't even started it, Al. Some game, Cincinnati 21, Pittsburgh 2. Oh, well, you hit them on a bad day. Yeah? Yeah, they had a good one once in 1938. Well, I don't know very much about baseball, but I can tell you what's wrong with the Pirates, all right, all right. Oh, you can, huh? Yes, their manager, that McGovern person. Of all the loud mouth, offensive, but... All those nice, clean-cut young men and the way he just bullies them. You ask me, the Pittsburgh Pirates would be a lot better off without him. And so would the city of Pittsburgh. Hey, write it. Write what? Just what you think about Guffy McGovern. Oh, but, but, but he's stupid. <laughs> Honey, compared to his real character, it'll read like a testimonial. Now sit down and pound it out. All right. I will. <laughs> said they must have liked my story. He said he wanted more of the same personal stuff about Guppy McGovern. But the only place he could be found in public, outside of the ball, ball, ball park, of course, was John's Steakhouse. Uh, they had the best steaks in town. And that night, I, I cornered him. Well, what do you want? Uh, I'm Jennifer Page. Uh, I wrote that story about you this morning in The Messenger. Uh, and if you so much as lift your hand or, or start to curse, why, I'll... I'll You'll uh, what? Well, didn't you read it? All I ever read is the box scores. Oh, well, I began this way. Quote, Aloysius X. McGovern, the evil-tongued order of the baseball field, is a surly, unbred goat whose mouth should be washed out regularly with a, with a strong detergent. Well... Don't ever call me Aloysius. You mean, you mean you're not even mad? Dogs have fleas. Managers have sports writers. Oh, but I'm not a sports writer. But I do have a few facts and figures about your... Oh, don't put so much ketchup on that steak. It's worth a flavor. A few facts and figures about your team that might be interesting. Yeah? Yeah. When an entire team goes as sour as the Pirates, well, Jimmy, I look around for a reason. And I look right at you, Mr. McGovern. And what do you have to say? Well, say it. Boo. What? Boo. Thank you. You've been very cooperative. Good night. Hey, waiter. Give me some more ketchup. Guffy McGovern. And a more obnoxious, overbearing... Well, anyway, that night I went to the ball game, and naturally the Pirates lost. Nine to nothing. After the game, Mr. McGovern disappeared into the dressing room. 
And you, Mr. Baxter, don't be so modest. Why, you made two of those seven errors all by yourself. Oh, I'm certainly proud of you athletes tonight. I'm sorry, Guffy, the light got in my eye. But I worry about your son. You're going to catch a fly ball one of these days and knock your front teeth right down your throat. And who have we here? Oh, yes, the famous Saul Hellman. You fellas may not realize this, but Saul once pitched a two-hitter in a World Series. Of course, that was quite some time ago. Don't you think you're a little old for this pastime, Saul? You should have quit when you can still reach the plate. Now, take it easy, Saul. He'll calm down. Well, I'm glad for one thing. Tonight's game puts us in eighth place. We can go no lower. Hey, is what coming all this been like this? You knew him in the miners, didn't you, Saul? Way back when? Yeah, way back when. Oh, now, look, you got plenty of stuff left. Plenty yeah, of stuff. Well, don't you, Saul. Hey, take it easy. He's coming back. Where's my good luck key? Uh, I, I put it in your uniform, Guffy. Well, where is it? Oh, maybe you dropped it out on the field. Hey, that doesn't make sense, does it? Good luck, Peace, and us in eighth place. Well, that's why Guffy McGovern left the dressing room and went out to the empty field. The lights were all out, but the moon was full. And Mr. McGovern got down on his knees and started to search for his good luck piece. Uh, Mr. McGovern was talking to himself. And a few of the things he said are repeatable, such as... Empty-headed bucket brain... Don't tell me I lost that good luck piece. You've misplaced it somewhere, you half-witted, lame brain. Oh, shut up for a change. What? Who said that? Who are you? Close your fat mouth. I want to talk to you. If that's some wise guy in the public address system, I'll bust his snoot. You bust nobody's snoot if you know what's good for you. You've been busting snoots and polluting the air with your father talk long enough. Frankly, we're fed up. Is that so? And who are you, might I ask? An angel. How's that? I'm an angel. Now let me get my hands on him. I'll make an angel out of him. None of your lips or I'll boot you over the center field wall. I can get just as tough as you. Remember that? I'll murder this guy. The angel Gabriel's taking a personal interest in you, big mouth. It seems someone down there has been sending up a lot of prayers on your behalf. One punch. That's all I ask. One punch. But before he answers those prayers, there are certain rules, McGovern, and I'll give them to you back. Look, wise guy, I'm going to find out who you are if I got... As I was saying, rule number one, cut out the blasphemy. Number two, quit making life miserable for everyone around you. Number three, and this is important, love and stop slugging thy neighbor. Do you hear me? I hear you fine. Now stand still and listen or I'll blast you with a bolt of lightning. See? Don't rile me, boy. Don't rile me. Brother. Now, I'll make a deal with you, loud mouth. Lay off swearing and fighting, and I'll win you some ball games. I might even win you a pennant. You play ball with me, and I'll play ball with you. How about it? Well, how do I know you're what you say you are? <laughs> Thundering what means not enough, huh? Okay, Aloysius, you trusting soul. Look for a miracle tomorrow night in the, uh, well, in the third inning. What kind of a miracle? Tomorrow night in the third inning. Hey, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, will you? And just then, in the moonlight, a feather floated down from nowhere. It could have come from the passing seagulls. <clears throat> if seagulls ever fly over Pittsburgh. Or it could have come from, from an angel's wing. Well, anyway, Duffy McGovern stared as it floated down. And there on the ground, where it landed, was his good luck piece. Well, sir, the next day against Cincinnati, it was nothing to nothing in the first two innings. In the third, Cincinnati's first man gets a base on balls. The second man hits the ball straight for that right field fence. Good for two bases at least. And then something happens. Ronson streaks after it like a deer. He climbs halfway up the fence and makes a perfect backhand catch. Two, one out, and the runner goes back to two. In the dugout, there's a strange look on the ugly face of Mr. Guffey, the cousin. Ronson caught that ball? Ronson? The next man up to Cincinnati hits a scorcher to the shortstop. 
And what does Manelli do? He slides 10 feet on his stomach, stabs the ball, kicks second base, and makes a perfect throw to first. Double play, the strike is tied. Oh, but that's not all. In that same third inning, Pittsburgh makes five runs, and they're still at that. There are two outs now, and then a real close play of four. Yes, I'm locked. Yo, hike me, you're out. Uh, uh, just a minute, Alf, just a minute. All right, McGovern, what about it? Well, uh, I was about to suggest that possibly you erred on that last decision, sir. Get off the field! Yes, sir. Nice going, Big Mouth. Huh? Oh, thanks. Pittsburgh won 12 to nothing. Then they left town and went on the road. They won 10 straight games. Oh, yes, the Pirates had come to life. And Duffy McGovern was a changed man. Well, the team was in sixth place when they played the Braves in Boston. And with the ninth inning, the Pirates were leading 8 to 6. And then, of course, the inevitable happened. It's something known as a rhubarb. In no time, players from both teams were on the field, and in the center of this activity was Mr. McGovern. But so gentle, so polite. Now, now, fellas. Fellas, please now. Just take it easy. I'll handle this, gentlemen. Get out of my way, you old That was the manager of the board. And that ill timed remark was just too much for Mr. McGovern. He started out with... You better mouth junkie, you, you fucking head. And I'll well, see it from there, as only Duffy McGovern could. As they say the grass in the infield turned blue. <laughs> Well, I can't vouch for that, but I can for the fact that the Pirates lost the game. That night, as was his custom now, Mr. McGovern walked out on the deserted dining room. He looked up at the vast expanse and sky and clouds. I, uh, I'm sorry. Take off your hat. Yes, sir. Now, look. All I said this afternoon was... I heard every word. Don't repeat that. But the guy called me an ape. Bow-legged ape. Yeah. Well, you are a little bow-legged. Well, what am I supposed to do? Take it as a compliment? The English language has a total of 698,000 words. We ask that you avoid a hundredth of one percent of these, which at the moment seems to be your entire vocabulary. Okay, okay, I keep my trap shut, I'll win all my ball games, huh? Now, wouldn't that look a little ridiculous, the Pirates winning every game? Yeah, yeah, I guess it would. Besides, we have other things to do, you know. A lot of the time, you'll be on your own. But when you need us, we'll be in there pitching. Yeah? Who's we? Me and my boys, the Heavenly Choir Nine. <laughs> ball players? Sure. In heaven? There are plenty of ball players in heaven. Well, what do you know? But, uh, very few managers. <laughs> uh, how, uh, how do your boys, uh, help? Oh, they sort of get behind your boys, throw out a few quick hunches. Uh, when your boys played ball down here, did I know any of them? Did I ever know you? Oh, we might have run into each other. On what base? Oh, come on. A guy's got a right to know his own angel. Give me a hint. Well, you lay off. Your broken down ball club is winning games. What more do you want? I'll see you around. Goodbye. Now, wait. Listen. I said goodbye and keep your nose out of things that don't concern you. All right. All right. Don't go away sore, huh? When the Pirates played their next game in Pittsburgh, it started out just like any other afternoon. But events were taking place in the bleachers. Some orphan kids had come to cheer for the home team. In charge of the children were two nuns, Sister Adwitha and Sister Veronica. And with them, a little girl named Sister. Who's picking, Sister Adwitha? I think that's Mr. Marty, dear. One, four, lost six. No control. Oh, don't worry about Marty. He's super. Let's go, Marty. Show my kid in Boston. Pass the peanuts to get here. The 
is in the sixth inning. The score, 72 in favor of the Phillies. And then, then suddenly it happened. Bridget, the little girl, saw something. Look! Look at the angel behind Mandicat! What did you say, dear? The angel behind Mandicat! Oh, and there's one behind Ransom, too! Ransom and Miss Indy! Well, there's one in back of everybody! One what? Angel! Get her out of the sun. Yes, come along, Bridget. Let's move back a few rows. How do you feel, dear? Oh, I feel fine, but I still see them. Angel! If people should hear you, dear, you'll get us in trouble. But I still see them, sister. Big as life. In the outfield, in the infield, and even on top of the scoreboard. Bridget, do you want us to leave and not come back? Oh, no, please. Very well. No, no more anything. The Pirates won, ten to seven. <laughs> it was getting to be a habit. On the way out, I ran into one of the park policemen. It seems he had overheard the little girl in the police seat. The orphan who saw Angel. Oh, it was a real break for me. Well, the next morning, when Guffy McGovern opened his door and reached for his morning paper, he had quite a shock. Angels help pirates win, says Orphan Moffat. McGovern's team gets celestial aid in defeating Phillies. And 30 minutes later, he was at the home. St. Gabriel's home for orphan girls. I'm Sister Ed Weaver, Mr. McGovern, Mother Superior. Well, I'm pleased to meet you. Now, about that kid, I... It's about Bridget. How the paper got the story, I have no idea. But I think it's best for all concerned that we just forget all about it. Yeah, but, well, excuse me, sister, but you don't know baseball. Baseball fans. See, the fans want answers. See, and I'm the manager. i got to supply them. A little girl sits too long in the sun, and she thinks she sees something. Surely you don't believe they were angels? Uh, me? Well, uh, would it do any harm just to talk to her? I don't want the child excited. Oh, I won't. No, ma'am. I promise. I've sent for her. She's waiting just across the hall. You may go in, Mr. McGovern. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Much obliged. Hi, Mr. McGovern. I'm glad to see you. Well, kid, did you read this in the paper? It says here that yesterday you saw angels. But I did. You're sure, huh? How did you know there were angels? Well, by their wings, Mr. McGovern. Wings, huh? Well, sort of like wings. No baseball uniforms? Well, sort of like uniforms. What color socks? I couldn't see. Their robes were too long. How many were there? One behind each player. The pirates, I mean. And one on the scoreboard and one in the bullpen. Was there, uh, was there one behind me? Uh-huh. Is he there now? Who's that? That statue? Yeah, the statue. Why, well, that's St. Gabriel. It figures. <laughs> Look, about the other kids, your friends, they didn't see anything, huh? Just you. Now, why was that, do you suppose? Maybe because I've been praying for you. Me? You've been praying for me? The whole team, ever since you hit the swamp. Well, thanks, kid. Hey, that was pretty nice of you. Well, you needed help, didn't you? We sure did. I prayed to St. Gabriel. He's our patron saint. Hey, what's your name? Bridget White, eight years old. How long have you been here? Eight years. Been nice talking to you, Bridget. Well, so long, kid. So long. Oh, and about those prayers. Keep them coming, huh? Yes, sir. And I'm glad to have met you, Mr. McGovern. Yeah, well, uh, we just want a couple of no, 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 you may not do it, child. I'm sorry. Now, please, go away. The whole story is ridiculous. There's Mr. McGovern now. Why don't you ask him? You all heard what the sister said. The same goes for me. No comment. Lay off me. Lay off me, will you? You want to know about angels? Ask her. Miss Household Hint. She wrote the story. Now, get out of my way. I'm going home. Now, what did I do? Hey, you up there. For heaven's sake, can't we have a little rainstorm without you running in? Oh. Oh, nothing personal, huh? Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. 
Me to visit the shambles that Guppy McGuffin called home. Oh, it's you, huh? Uh huh. Okay, come on in. Uh, I'm only here to say I'm, I'm sorry. Honestly, I had no idea that story about angels would raise such a fuss. Well, if I had, I never would have. Oh, what a mess this place is. Well, I never would have written it. Your big mistake was showing up at that orphanage. So I made a mistake. All those other newspapers? Well, they're just going to make a monkey out of you, that's all. Goat monkey. I'm used to it. You know, if I were you, McGovern, I'd make a statement and protect myself. To you? Sure, why not? My goodness, I just don't see how you can live in such confusion. Just look at this place. Why, there isn't even room for a guest to sit down. There might be an idea in that. Well, you can't get rid of me yet, so you might just as well make the best of it. Say, were you always so tough, even when you were little? You had a boyhood, of course. Yeah, Tilton Falls, Wisconsin. I looked you up. Sounds like a nice little town. Was. Four pool halls, five saloons, and the biggest pants factory in the state. <laughs> Did you play ball there? I sold peanuts. Oh, oh, uh, your folks weren't very well off, huh? My folks did fine. They had one of the saloons. <laughs> and uh, then one day they gave you a ball and a bat, and that's how you got started. Well, not exactly. I used to throw snowballs at the cop on the corner. It was a long block and a long winter, so I finished up a third basement. Now, if there's nothing else, Miss Page, why don't you run on back to your office and dream up some more of your household hints? You could do with a few yourself, you know. The door, Miss Page. Well, of all the conceited knuckleheads... Uh-uh. Now, will you watch it, please? We don't use that kind of language around here. Don't worry. I'm going. But when your cleaning woman comes, tell her to get rid of all these old newspapers and to put Eric in the corner to get rid of that awful cigar smell. And then... I like cigar smoke. Oh, and to scour the ashtrays with ammonia. Will you please go home or something? You know, I could be a big help to you, McGovern, if you weren't so... Well... <laughs> Well, a long walk in the rain helps me to cool off. Before I knew it, I found myself at the St. Gabriel's home for orphan girls. I had a nice talk with Sister Rita and little Bridget. And I got permission to take Bridget to the baseball game the following afternoon. <laughs> oh, she had a wonderful time. Of course, the boys in the press box kept showing up with a steady stream of hot dogs, ice cream, 7-Up. How's it, Bridget? Vanilla okay? Oh, thank you. Al, Al, I think that's the milk. She's only eight years old. Well, how's it going, honey? The angel's working yet? Uh-uh. Well, now you be sure and let us know, won't you? You uh, let us know, won't you? Do you live all alone, Miss Page? All by myself. That must be nice. Why? I mean, instead of having a lot of kids around all the time. Oh, well, that depends. I always say, why not live alone if you can live alone? Just like if you had someone around the house all the time, you couldn't even come to the ball game when you wanted to. Well, not unless I brought her with me. Oh, look. What's the matter? They're warming up. Who? The angels. Oh, now, Bridget, no. Here they come, out on the field. Bridget, there's no one on that field except the players and the umpires. Can't you see them? There's one behind every player. Oh, come on. We're getting out of here right now. Look, fellas, we're leaving. Now, Father is good. Uh, Bridget, Bridget, how many angels? How many can you see? Nine. And one extra for Mr. McDonough. <laughs> The story exploded into a national issue. Everybody was now talking about McGovern's Angels. And Pittsburgh kept winning. They took a series from the Giants and settled down in fourth place. Well, one Saturday afternoon, when Guppy came home from the ballpark, he found company waiting for him. Well, aren't you surprised? 
It's us, Mr. McGovern. Happy birthday, Mr. McGovern. Hey, what goes on here? Oh, a birthday party, of course. Many happy returns. Now, how'd you know it was my birthday? Bridget, look it up in the sporting news. Boy, I haven't had a birthday party since I was 10 years old. That's a long time. It sure is. The book says it's... Uh, never mind, honey. <laughs> uh, now, you have been setting the table, and Mr. McGovern will help me in the kitchen. Huh? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. I hope you don't mind. She's getting such a kick out of it. Well, why should I mind? Hey, what smells? Huh? So good, I mean. Oh. Well, uh, that's ragu of veal a la brignoli. Oh, fancy stuff, huh? You eat too many steaks. A change would be good for you. And you can thank uh, Mrs. Hawk Ryder Cates of Lawson Avenue. Is that mm-hmm. so? Uh-huh. Her favorite recipe, guaranteed to keep men at home. <laughs> we printed it last week in household hints. Well, we won again today, didn't we? Yes, we did. You know, Saul Hellman went all the way. I uh, don't suppose you realize we're only nine games out of first place. Oh, I've heard some talk. Oh, oh, it's so wonderful. Just a few weeks ago, we were last. I wonder how it happened. Angels? Oh, no, no, I'm serious. It's my theory that, well, that you've done it. Me, huh? Sure. The Pirates are playing as a team now. You're not losing your temper, you're not yelling your head off, and you're not swinging on people. Sister Weezer says never swing on people. You should turn the other cheek. There, you see. Well, uh, I guess we can sit down now. Here's your present, Mr. McGovern. This one's from Jennifer. So open it. I, uh, I don't mind saying I'm kind of excited. Well, what do you know? A necktie. It, it, it's not too loud, is it? Yellow and green? <laughs> Who says it's loud? Gee, thanks a lot. And now here's mine. Well, it's pretty hard to wrap on account of its round. No, a, a baseball. Only it's not just an ordinary baseball. Jennifer sent it into the clubhouse and all the pirates signed it. See? An autographed baseball. Well, that's just what I wanted. Well, how about eating this while it's still hot, huh? Oh, what's the matter, Bridget? What, um, what about Grace? Grace who? <laughs> oh, oh, Grace. Yeah, I almost forgot. Um... Why don't you, uh, why don't you lead off, Bridget? Oh, Lord, make us truly thankful for these bad gifts which we are about to receive. Amen. Well, I'm real hungry. Oh, I hope I fixed enough of everything. <laughs> Cooking for myself the way I do, I'm never quite sure, but... <clears throat> oh, don't eat it. Uh, the veal? But it's, uh, it's kind of delicious. Oh, no, don't. It's poison. Oh, I never in all my life... Mrs. Hawkwriter, Kate of Rawson Avenue, is certainly going to hear about this in the morning... Keeps men home, does it? Well, maybe she means permanently. Well, I, 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 I just can't understand it. Let's see now. I left out olive oil. Could it have been rancid? How long have you had it, Duffy? What olive oil? The olive oil in the cupboard. In the bottle in the cupboard. That's neat's foot oil. <laughs> it's what? Not olive oil. Neat's foot oil. I rub it on my glove. Keeps the leather soft. Well, of all the... What's it doing in the kitchen cupboard? Well, I gotta put it someplace. It's wonderful for gloves. Well, it certainly doesn't do anything for veal. The peas are fine. Yeah, but you can't make a meal on cheese. Oh, I feel awful. I should have looked at the bottle. I always look at the bottle. I don't know why. This time I Now didn't... wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is my birthday, and I'm not gonna have it spoiled by Mrs. Harkrider Gates of Rawson Avenue. Grab your things, Bridget. We're going over to John's steakhouse. <laughs> Duffy's birthday dinner at John's Steakhouse was a big success. Uh, you see, at John's Steakhouse, they very rarely cook with meat foot oil. And later that night, when Duffy walked her home... Well, this is it, Duffy. Here's where I live. What's the matter? I, uh... I've been thinking about that kid, Bridget. She just adores you, you know. Have you ever thought of adopting her? Who, me? Sure. Uh, what would I want with a kid around the house? Besides, a thing like that, well, it presents certain problems. What kind of problems? Oh, problems. So you have been thinking about it, huh? Well, I asked her. I asked Sister Edwita. Oh, forget it. Well, it's been a wonderful evening. Thanks, Guppy. Oh, uh, wait a minute. What? You know, a long time ago, I played third base in Minneapolis. 
There was a dame at St. Paul, the nicest girl I ever knew. Oh? Yeah, we did a lot of talking, and I made some big plans. Only they didn't include a certain shortstop. The one she finally married it was quite a blow. I can imagine. I guess I've been taking it out on everybody else ever since. Well, good night. Good night, Duffy. In September, the Pirates were leading the Giants in the final series. They needed three straight games to win the pennant. It was during one of these games, in the ninth inning, that I shouted to Guppy from the stand. Uh, he was coaching at first. And just as he turned to look at me, the batter hit a hard foul ball. And Guppy stopped it with his head. It didn't knock him out, but he took quite a wallop. After the game, a lot of the reporters were waiting to see him. So you're okay, huh, Guff? No permanent injuries? Uh, I've been hit on the boy on the head twenty times. I feel fine. Hey, do you see any angels out there, McGovern, or just stars? Now let me tell you guys something. I never seen an angel in all my life. What? But I talk to one regularly, all the time. Well, what, what did you say? Oh, no, Puffy, no. Sure. You talk to angels. Huh? That's right. Oh, come on, hey, Mark, Can we quote you on that? Well, why not? An angel sits in back of me in a dugout oh, every day. Oh, why he said it, if it was that knock on his head or, or what. But he certainly said it, and the papers had a field day. Poor Guffy. They killed him without mercy. Pictures, stories, even radio and television. Only one person took it seriously. Bridget. Look, sister, isn't that wonderful? I see him and Guffy talks to him. Now, among those who gave the story its biggest ride was a sports announcer named Bayless. Uh, some months back, when the Pirates were in the cellar, Guffy had taken a swing at Mr. Bayless, and Mr. Bayless had never forgotten it. And one night on the radio... And his latest little stunt is an unqualified admission to the press that he converses with angels. That's why angels... Oh, for heaven's sake, you were hit in the head. You could have said anything. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to hear this. The manager of the Pirates is unworthy of the high position he now commands. Guffy McGovern is emotionally unstable and guilty of conduct detrimental to organization. Why, well, that, 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 no, please. Mr. Ford has claimed his peculiar statement was made after being hit on the head with a line drive, that he is not responsible. You see, he admits it. I would like to ask Mr. McGovern a question. Was he responsible seven weeks ago in Boston? How about it, McGovern? What? Seven weeks ago, were you or were you not sound of mind and limb? Well, here in the studio tonight, folks, is a man who can answer these questions. Is a what? Would you tell us your name, please? Uh, Patrick J. Finley. I'm groundkeeper at Bravesfield. I don't know. Now, will you please tell us what you saw at Bravesfield about seven weeks ago? Well, I, um, I saw Mr. McGovern. He was sitting on second base after the game. What was he doing? He was talking. Talking? Who to? Well, that's it. There wasn't anybody there. What did he say? Well, I couldn't hear everything. I was sweeping out the dugout. But uh, one thing he said was, um, I have a right to know the name of my own angel. Mm. Oh. He said that? My own angel? Yes, sir. Uh, then he said, don't go away mad. Thank you, Mr. Finley. Now, I ask you, baseball fans, and you, Mr. Commissioner, is this the act of a normal, reasonable man? Well, as much as I hate to say this, I think that Mr. McGovern should take a long time. I didn't see Guffy after the game that night. Nobody seemed to know where he'd gone. But maybe you know, huh? Well, you're right. Around past midnight, when Forbes Field was completely deserted, Guffy sneaked out to second base, looked up at the sky, and started talking. It's me again. Well, well, it's about the boys. They get nervous, see? All this stuff in the papers about me talking to angels. Who told you to laugh about it? Well, nobody. But if this keeps up, they're going to fall apart. I, uh, I thought maybe you got something you could suggest. Oh, they're just nervous. Perfectly natural at a time like this. How are you doing, boy? Me? Oh, great. 
They're only trying to throw me in the loony bin, that's all. And just to make matters worse, I'm fresh out of pitchers. That's all? Well, you ought to know. Martin's got a bad arm, Clark's on the sick list, and Saul Hellman's an old man. He wouldn't last three innings. Yeah, Saul three times. Sixteen years is a lot of pitching in the major league. Well, it's his last. So next season, I want to send him to the minors. That won't make any difference to Saul. He won't be around next season. What? We're signing him up in the spring. Saul? Oh, no. Yeah, everybody gets to play up here sooner or later. But Saul, we were friends, pals. At least we used to be. He was a great pitcher once. He pitched a two-hitter in the World Series. Yes, I know. I was there. Good night, McGovern. Yeah. Good night. The next day, thanks to Bayless, the sports announcer, the lead commissioner arrived in Pittsburgh. There was quite a gang of newspaper people to meet him at the airport. I can only tell you this. In the matter of Mr. McGovern, all parties concerned will meet tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Until I hear all the evidence, there's nothing more I can say. But, but Mr. Commissioner, the Pirates are playing their last game of the season tomorrow afternoon. It's for the pennant. Thank you. I'm well aware of that. Well, I mean, do you think that this is the proper time to conduct an, an investigation? My dear young lady, any time is the proper time when the situation warrants it. Baseball is for the people who support it. My desk is piled high with letters. In other words, sir, you think that Guffey McGovern splits his lid, right? Yes. No, no. Come around tomorrow. I'll tell you then. Well, what is it? courtroom trial. The investigation hints on two points. One, are there such things as angels? And two, is it possible to talk to them? Now, how long have you been practicing psychiatry, Dr. Blaine? Eighteen years, Commissioner. Well, you've heard McGovern's account of how a, a group of, uh, of angels helped his ball team. How did his story impress you? Well, originally man worshipped the sun, the moon, or stones and trees. But with the rise of religion, man felt the need of a closer alliance with the supreme being. So he invented the angel. Invented? Precisely. Just as a hurt child will run to its parents, so will man turn for comfort to a belief in angels. Mr. Bayless? Yes. Now, when this belief takes the form of actual conversation with angels, Doctor, what's your professional opinion? I'd prefer not to say, Mr. Bayless. But I'd be very happy to see Mr. McGovern in my office. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Commissioner. Well, McGovern? I'd like to introduce three witnesses for the defense. Why, of course. Uh, you gentlemen over there. I don't know any of them, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, my name is Guppy McGovern. I'm Dr. Danford of Trinity Church. Rabbi Alan Hahn of Temple Israel. Father O'Hulan, Church of Our Lady, Queen of Angels. Well, thanks. Well, I, I suppose you know the general idea in back of this hearing, so what do you think about it? I mean, do you suppose there might be angels? Lead the way, Dr. Danforth. Well, <clears throat> to deny the existence of angels is to deny the word of the Holy Bible, which is specific on the subject. From the ancient uh, Hebrew text, we have the words Bene Elohim, the sons of God, uh, Gedushim, the holy ones, and uh, Mal the, Mal uh, How do you pronounce it? Uh, Malachim. Uh, Malachim. Uh, thank you, Rabbi. And uh, Malachim, the messengers. Now, all of these may be translated angels. Uh, you'll check me on that, Rabbi Han. It was an angel who guided the children of Israel to the promised land. And in Psalms, we again find an angel, the protector of man, angel of the Lord and campus around them, and so forth. Father Houlihan, seeing as how there are whole coveys of angels splitting through the pages of the Holy Scriptures, both Old and New Testament, 
I don't see how I can get out of saying I believe in them. I imagine the commissioner does, too. Now, please, just, just leave me out of this. Father, do you also believe that angels play baseball? Well, now, son, considering all the great wonders that angels have performed, I'd be much surprised if they couldn't play baseball. <laughs> ah, but would they? Is it likely that a group of angels would lend support to a man like, like Guffy McGovern? If a man should have a hundred sheep and one of them should go astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine in the mountains and go and seek that which has gone astray? That's from Matthew, son. <laughs> and besides, the Lord uh, isn't as small-minded as some of us mortals. And now, Mr. Commissioner, I had a short talk with Rabbi Hahn in the elevator, and we both discovered that we're seeing a ball game at 1.30, so as you don't mind. Oh, not at all, but uh, you'd better hurry. Oh, and if Dr. Blaine would care to see me in my office, I'd be very happy indeed. <clears throat> hey, hey, fellas, why are you studying? <laughs> Well, gentlemen, I've listened to both sides, and frankly, I'm baffled. I'm sure we'd all like to believe in angels. I know I would. But if I only had just one tiny bit of concrete evidence, no matter how... Oh, excuse me. Are, uh, are you sure you're in the right room, sister? I think so, Mr. Commissioner, and I'm sorry I'm so late. This child is rigid white. He wants to testify for Mr. McDonald. Mr. Commissioner, a minute ago you were all set to make a decision. Now, let's get on with it. I don't want anyone hammering away at this kid. Sister, won't you please get her out of here? Mr. McDonald, why are you afraid of? Huh? Well, okay, kid. Sit down, huh? Bridget White. Hmm. Uh, where do you live, little girl? St. Gabriel, I come for us and girls. You, uh, you believe in angels? Does not everyone? Well, no. No, they don't. But I saw them. Twice. I saw them in the ballpark. They were helping the pirates. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, may I question the witness? Go ahead, Mr. Bailey. Now, Bridget, when you saw your, uh, angels, what were they doing? Well, there was one standing behind Mr. McGovern. But you didn't see him talk to Mr. McGovern. No, but I know he must have. Why? Because Mr. McGovern says so. And you think that one of your angels, one of these heavenly messengers, would talk to a man like Guppy McGovern? Of course. Any angel would be proud to talk to a nice man like Mr. McGovern. Quiet, please. Quiet. Is that all, sir? Uh, Mr. Commissioner, I hope we're not going to accept this as testimony. The child is obviously prejudiced. What are you talking about, Taylor? Isn't it true that you tried to adopt this child? That you've made a declaration of this intention to the orphan's court? Well, suppose I did. What about it? It's by Mr. McGovern. Well, there's nothing definite yet. I don't need to be even know if the court let me have her. You don't just walk in and adopt a child as... It's problems, like like being well married. Oh, there's no problem here, Guppy. Just ask me. <laughs> Nevertheless, you want to adopt her. Oh, that's nice. That's very touching. The little girl who saw the angels now stands up to testify for Mr. McGovern. But isn't isn't she actually testifying for Papa? And isn't Papa? Oh, no. Thank you. Gentlemen, I think in view of the fact, all things considered, this case is dismissed. <laughs> I lost Duffy in the shuffle. All I caught was a glimpse of it. It took me into a taxi cab. But I knew where he was going. To fall the field. That was a nice little break a few stakes, McGovern. Why the show? Look, you heard what the fella said. What else could I do? You had no right to slug it. How many times do I have? Okay, okay. Keep your shirt, or Keep your wings on. <laughs> I only hit him once or twice. You completely destroyed the bridge work. Well, I'm sorry. Send me a bill. Well, you ought to be sorry. The 
because when you busted that bridge work, you also busted our little agreement. Agreement? We're through with you, Coppin. Oh, please. Now, don't make jokes. It's no joke. We're finished. Look, a pennant's hanging on that game today. You can't walk out on me now. I need you. Kind of a shame, isn't it? But don't worry. You've been on your own lots of times the last day with me. But I don't like to be on my own. I'm not happy on my own. I'll let you in on a little secret. You've learned something, Guppy. You don't know it yourself yet, but you've learned there's more important things in life than winning ball games. We're, um, well, we're a little proud of you, boy. Well, skip the proud routine and just be at Forbes Field at 1.30. That's all I want. Sorry, oh, can't make it. And tell that cab driver to slow down. He's making me nervous. Dirty trick. Who ever heard of an angel who would stoop so low and do such a low oh, down dirty? Oh, now listen. Good luck, Paul. Now wait. Come back. Look, just for a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're here, Mac. Ford <laughs> Field. Oh, thanks, Cabby. What do I owe you? N -n -n Nothing. Just tell me one thing. Who was you talking to? You mean my angel? Oh, he's nothing but a feather merchant. After all these weeks, he picks the day to run out. What a character. I guess you're wondering what happened that memorable afternoon at Forbes Field when the Pirates played the Giants for the tennis. Well, this much I can tell you. After eight innings, the score was two to one, Pittsburgh. The pitcher, Saul Hellman, all the way. But Saul was old and tired, and in the ninth inning, they really got him. Mr. Bayless, of course, was back in the press box, describing the game on the radio. very shaky all the way, folks. But for some reason, McGovern's insisted on leaving him in the game. But the Pittsburgh fans can be denied no longer. Guppy McGovern has finally made up his mind to take Hellman out. But it may be too late. A hit could win this ball game for the Giants. Guppy's out on the mound right now talking to Hellman. Hard to say who'll replace him. Two Pittsburgh pitchers have been warming up. What do you think, Charles? Can you do it? I had Guppy, but I'd sure like to try. It's your ball game. Stay in there. Thanks, Guppy. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. McGovern has just made the ball head play of his career. He's leaving Hellman in the ball game. The base is loaded, and Dobie Rascala is back. Rascala, who leads the league and runs bad again. To be back one in now, Mr. McGovern had better leave Tom. Well, Hellman's taking his time out there. That tired arm needs every second of rest he can get. He glances at his outfield. Here it comes. They've been hitting that first stick, but not this time. Let's tell it. Long and he missed. Strike one. Hellman goes for the rosin bag now. Takes off his cap. Wipes his forehead. Looks at his catcher for the signal. Takes the signal. Gets another. Goes into the windup. Here it comes. He knows it only takes one to hit it. Hellman still taking his time. He's a very, very tired pitcher right now. He watches the runner at third, rubs the ball, and stands motionless on the mound. All right, into the windup. Here's the pitch. Well, there you have it. Final score, Pittsburgh 2, New York 1. And, of course, a pennant for the Pirates. Well... I hope Mr. McGovern's angels are pleased with the way things turned out. Are you happy up there, little angels? Why don't you shut up? Long after the game was over, we were still at Fort Field. Just the three of us. Bridget, Duffy, and I. It was dark now. The grandstand was empty. We just stood there for a while, looking up at the sky. I can't see him, Duffy. Not even one angel. Me neither, honey. It was really true, though, wasn't it, Duffy? Well, somebody must have helped me. 
Not only on the ball field, either. Look what I got. I got you, and I got Bridget. Some double play. <laughs> I wonder who they were, those angels. Well, you name them, honey. They're all up there. Walter Johnson, John McGraw, Christy Matthewson, Eddie Collins, Lou Gehrig, Babe Ruth. Great names. Great guys. Cummings with our stars. And here they are, two angels and a cherub, for that heavenly applause. George Murphy, Janet Lee, and Donna Cochran. <laughs> well, where has Hollywood's ambassador of goodwill been lately, George? Oh, I'm just sort of a roving troubadour, Irving. I speak for my supper here and there. Such belittling and such nonsense. Beside all the wonderful public relations work you do for our town and our industry, how about President Eisenhower's inauguration? What office were you running for, Mr. Murphy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wasn't running for any office. I just had the great privilege and pleasure of being in charge of the entertainment for the inaugural festivity. You see, Donna, George is a very special person. He tells other people about our wonderful motion pictures, our beautiful California. Our lovely Lux girls, particularly MGM Lux girls, like Janet and Donna here. I certainly am a Lux girl, George. It's my favorite complexion care. And how about you, Donna? My Lux girl, if I wash my face every day? If you use Lux soap and water. <laughs> then I've been one for years and years. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean about these MGM girls? And then there's Lily, young Beth, confidentially Connie. Who are they? I know that Lily is a charming picture, co-starring Leslie Caron and Mel Ferrer. And young Beth is just great with Gene Simmons, Stuart Granger, and Deborah Carr. And uh, confidentially, I'm Connie, co-starring with Van Johnson. Wow. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Porter Soap, invite you to be with us again next Monday evening. When the Lux Radio Theater presents Jane Wyman and Dick Ames in Just For You. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. Third in our cast tonight were Joseph Kearns as the Angel, Dan Riss as Chunk, Jeff Franken as the Empire. Helen Cleave as Sister Edwitha, Lawrence Dobkin as the Rabbi, Herb Ellis as Saul, Stephen Don as Bayless, and Yvonne Sadie, Tony Barrett, Fred Mackay, Bob Griffin, William Johnstone, Herb Butterfield, Eddie Firestone, Herb Rawlinson, Ralph Montgomery, and Eddie Marr. Our radio play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was written and directed by Rudy Schrager.